Hello again, Fizzles family and friends. This is the daily pastoral message for Wednesday, May 27th. Last night we had our Bible study, and so today's message will be a summary of our discussion from Bible study. We're continuing in our study of the book of Acts, using as our guide the Listen Up Bible Study curriculum from the United Church of Christ. This unit that covers the first six chapters of Acts is by Reverend Anthony B. Robinson. And so we are in chapter three of Acts today. Last week we covered chapter two, which included the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which we will celebrate in worship this Sunday. But now we move on to the next stories that are in Acts, in chapter 3. Chapter 3 is divided into two main sections, so I'll read the first section and then talk about it a little bit and then read the second section with further discussion. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. A man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him down at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked at him intently. as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he took the man by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, the man stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so here we see, now filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles Peter and John are continuing Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission was teaching, preaching, and healing, and bringing people close to the kingdom of God. And so even though Jesus has left this earth, he has charged the disciples with continuing his, his mission. And so Peter, in the name of Jesus, commands the man to stand up and walk, and he does. And then what does the man do? Importantly, he is so gratified that his ability to walk not yet has been restored. It's been given to him. He's been lame since birth. He hasn't been able to walk since birth. And he gets up and rises and runs to the temple and praises God. And so within this healing, we see an example of giving gratitude to God. And so when we receive blessings from God, we should remember to give gratitude to God as well. One of the questions that was brought up in the class and by the study material was this. When reading a story like this, a miracle story, we sometimes ask, do miracles really happen or not? We would suggest, the, the author would suggest, that this is not the question that this story itself asks or is primarily concerned with. Rather, Acts 3 may ask other questions. For example, does God's power have the capacity to change lives? Or is this story might be asking us if we in the church are in the business of business as usual, are we in, are, are, or are we in the business, God's business, of changing lives through healing? 
So this could be looked at a story of a one-time miracle that happened very shortly after the coming of the Holy Spirit, but then it would be a nice story. It might improve faith. We know that Jesus gave the disciples the power to heal, but the deeper meaning of the story that I think Reverend Robinson is getting at is to use this story as an example of what it calls us as the church to be and do. And so as the church, we have the ability to be healers in God's name. Now, we may not get a miraculous healing by somebody standing up and walking, but what if somebody comes into contact with us or we come into contact with somebody in our activities or lives outside of the church that we have the opportunity to show Jesus' love, that we have the opportunity perhaps to somebody who has been outcast, who's been separated from their community, who's been shunned, to show them love, to show them Jesus' love, God's love that he has placed in our hearts, and that can be a healing force. And so the miracle isn't just what happened in first century Palestine. The miracle is that we can still be healers in Jesus' name here and now. One of the other parts of this story and this part of the chapter is with the man's reaction to being healed, he was able to rejoin his community. He went to the temple, the scripture says, to praise God. If he was healed, all he, he never got across the threshold of the temple. He was always there just at the gate and never allowed to go in because he would have needed to walk in on his own. People who were lame at that point, crippled, were shunned from society. He was lucky to find people that would carry him to the temple. At least they had that much kindness. But now that he is healed, he can participate in the full life of the community. And so, again, we are called to be healers in God's name, to bring people into the community, the community of faith, the community of love that we know through Jesus Christ. Let's go on and read the rest of the chapter. While the man clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God had raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did our rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what, had, what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that the times of refreshing may come to the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you. And it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. And all the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, also predicted these days. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and your descendants, and in your descendants all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And so here in this 
second part of chapter 3, we see Peter explaining to the people that are amazed by seeing this man who was crippled from birth up, walk, jumping, praising God, and tells them, first of all, that it wasn't Peter or it wasn't his buddy John who did this work. It was Jesus Christ, the author of life, the one who came to heal that did the work. And they are just acting in Jesus's name because Jesus is the one who gives us the power to share that love that can be so healing. And so here in chapter 3, Peter does a lot the same thing that he did in chapter 2 after people were wondering about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Peter gives this sermon to explain what it means. Well, he's doing it again here. And so it means that the power comes from Jesus. And then he goes, as happens so often in Scripture, and recaps the, the salvation history of the, of the Israelites, that from, Ad, from Abraham they have been made to be a blessing to all people that just having their ancestry be in Abraham doesn't grant them any special privilege. They are called by God to be a blessing to everyone. And again, if we look at it in modern times, we are called by God to be God's people, and we are called to also be a blessing to others. We need to listen to the call of the prophets to hear what the prophets say about doing God's will, to be that blessing, whether it's to further justice and mercy or whether it's to share Jesus' love in the gospel. We have a mission that has been given to us. Now, we can get into talking about God's grace. God's grace is still a free gift. We don't do God's mission to earn God's God's favor. But because, like the man who was healed, that God has come into our lives, Jesus has come into our lives and filled us with love in gratitude, we should willingly and joyously complete God's mission or work towards God's mission of love so that God's will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, this isn't just a story of what happened over 2,000 years ago. It's a story of what it's calling us to be as the church, to continue Jesus' mission. So some of the other questions in the, in the homework. It says to reread verses 8 and 9. Why do you think Luke stresses that the lame man was not only leaping and walking, but he's also praising God. What relationship is there between healing and praising God? So verses 8 and 9 say, Jumping up, the man stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And so, yes, as I said, when the man received his healing, he was so joyous that, that Luke points out that he praised God. He leaped up and he was just overjoyed. And so when we feel that God is touching our lives and healing our lives and making us whole, we should be overjoyed as well and we should give God the praise, give God our thanksgiving, our gratitude. Then it says, what makes it clear that this transformation has not been brought about, or Peter, excuse me, Peter makes it clear that this transformation has not been brought about by, on their own, not by Peter and John's piety, by their own special powers. What, why does Peter stress this? And what has brought this transition about according to Jesus? Well, we've mentioned that it's the power of Jesus that has the power to heal. And Jesus has made apostles of the disciples, including Peter and John, but it's not their own power. It's them praising God and to, in Jesus' name, to give the power to heal. So at the end of each of these sessions, we have uh, questions. The first question is always, in this passage, a message that God is, of God who is still speaking to me is, and then it says in the passage, a message of God who is still speaking to our churches. And so some of the thoughts on question one, uh, 
response from, from June was that Jesus uh, said that we should, in his name, bring others to the church. And Ruth said that we are, we are sometimes the people in the temple, and God is giving us a second chance. God is calling us to repent. So a lot of times we look at these Bible stories and we see the people that behave well and we like to say, hey, we're the ones that are behaving well. Maybe we're, you know, I mean, obviously we're called to be the church. We're called to be Peter and John who spread Jesus's healing message. But too often we're the ones that Peter and John are talking to that may uh, resist that message and we need to repent as Peter says. And so sometimes, yeah, we're the ones that are gathered around uh, who need to repent ourselves and to hear that message. And, and Tony said that uh, sometimes we need to try harder to be aware of other people who are in need. And then when we had the, um, well, what I said then was in gratitude, we are to share God's love and to help change lives and to be thankful for God's presence and power in our lives or speaking for myself in my life to be more thankful for that and the second question what's God saying to the church I'll start with mine it says be the church to help others feel welcomed in love continue Jesus's mission of love and healing to be that blessing to others and there Tony said be mindful of those in need uh, even when that need isn't necessarily obvious. Joyce said, with uh, there are times in, in her life when God has seemed far away, but then she realized that God is there all the time and that God will also show us the way as he showed her dealing with her cancer to get through that, he will show us the way to get through this COVID virus. And oh, actually, it was Terry. Yeah, and Terry said we need to go and we need to go and out and be the church at times. I uh, and I'm. My handwriting is not that great. It may have been Tony and it may have been Terry to, to said. I think it actually was Terry who said to be mindful of those in need and when they're not obvious. So I'll give credit to both of them. But it was Terry who said that sometimes we need, need to think about going outside of the church uh, to find those in need. And that is true. The church is not the building. The church is the people. And so going out and seeing those in need to see how we can live the gospel and share the gospel not only by our words but by our actions and that may not be within the confines of the building hopefully it's not because most of us have not been in the building in the last two and a half months but we've we've tried to continue to be the church so we need to hear what god is calling us to do as the church here and now and that might be a whole new thing. It says in the book of Isaiah, see, I'm doing a new thing. And so in this time of separation, in this time of COVID, we need to keep our eyes and ears open for what God is calling us to do, that we are not called to be a business of, as usual people. We're called to see the new thing that God is doing and then go out and join in the work of God that, he has charged, that God has charged us with. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to study and to know your word better so that it may lead our life. We ask you, O oh Lord, to guide us as your church to see others in need and to draw them into the family of faith that they will know the love that we have experienced through your son, Jesus Christ. We need to share that love and to, in gratitude, be the church to continue the mission that you started so long ago and that still continues to this day. We continue to pray for all those who are suffering from the COVID virus and ask, O oh Lord, that you send your healing spirit, your healing power to them. Continue to strengthen and encourage us and strengthen and encourage all those who are providing care to those in need, whether from the virus or from other needs that are continuing 
even in this time. All these things we ask knowing that the power to heal comes through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I look forward to Bible study class next Tuesday and then to share the wisdom of the class with you on Wednesday, on the day after the class. I really look forward to worshiping with folks on Sunday here in our drive-in worship. I will be sending specific information about that worship time on Sunday in today's email. And so look for that. And I will talk to you all again tomorrow in the daily message. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay strong. And I know God is continuing to bless us all. Goodbye for now.